Welcome back to Secure Freedom Radio. It's Jim Hansen sitting in for Frank Gaffney. And this segment, we're joined with General Joseph Schrodell, a retired Brigadier General who served in United States Army Corps of Engineers and currently Executive Director of the Society of American Military Engineers. Welcome to the show, Joe. Hey, thanks, Jim. Appreciate the time. Well, I, I wanted to pick your brain a little bit about some of the dangers to our critical infrastructure and the role military engineering can play in making them a little safer. We have a lot of vulnerabilities, and I, I think one of the areas that is particularly at risk is our electric grid. And I, I wondered if you could give us just kind of a primer on how the U.S. military looks at vulnerabilities to its power supplies and what they've done to mitigate that. The first point that I would make, I think it's interesting to note an executive order that came out related to climate change that they kind of focused on four steps that we need to prepare. We need to then absorb whatever happens. And I think that's not just mother nature, but man-made. Then we need to recover. Then we need to adapt. So if you take those four steps that were laid out in that executive order, I think you'll find that our military engineering organizations, the Corps of Engineers, NAVFAC, the Air Force Engineers, Public Health Service, Coast Guard, are all, as a part of this government and as part of securing our national security, not just defense, you know, are all focused on that. And it adds up to one word, resilience. How do we ensure, and this is the foremost concern about the military to get to your question, how do we ensure that we, the military, can perform their mission regardless of something happens? So let's talk about energy for a second. So if the grid goes down, how, do the, how can the military ensure that, in fact, they can perform their mission if the grid's down, prepare to deploy whatever they need to do on installation. So a lot of the energy discussions in the military focus on ensuring that there is reliable power on military installations. So in the past, it's been, uh, been things like generators, which take a lot of fuel, which take a lot of, uh, a lot of other resources to keep them going, so still vulnerable. Second option, how about renewable energy? I would tell you a lot of the services are finding that renewable energy options are expensive and maybe don't break even. So you've got cost considerations. Kind of tough in a post-war environment that we're finding ourselves sort of in now, where in fact, you know, the resources aren't there to pay those extra things. So microgrids become a way. Matter of fact, the first microgrid that was put in place in Silver Spring, Maryland, was actually done by one of our members. And it was the uh, installation at the FDA headquarters in Silver Spring. It includes several turbine generators capable of producing 21 megawatts of power. On the West Coast, the Port of Los Angeles is a good example, where they're instituting an energy management action plan that includes things like rooftop solar, uh, some other emergency power generation, small-scale microgrid pilot projects for contingency, contingency operations. So, so in essence, what the military is concerned about is ensuring that there's reliable power on installations so they can complete their missions if they're asked to do something when the greater grid may be out for whatever reason. So, so back to my point about resilience, uh, it's preparing by doing some of those kinds of things, being able to absorb whatever Mother Nature throws at you, which means keep going, uh, and then recover to reestablish the major grid connection, and then learn from that and look forward and adapt for how do we keep things moving forward. So let me stop there and see if that might prompt some, some thought. One of the things that has been discussed, at least recently, during the discussions about the Iranian nuclear deal, is a document that showed that the Iranians actually had plans to attempt to take down our grid using an EMP. Folks you know, who don't know, that's an electromagnetic pulse. It's created when a nuclear weapon is detonated high in the atmosphere. Is there any hardening or any other things that can be done? Regardless of the threat, you know, whether it's an EMP threat, whether it's hackers, whether it's whatever, you know, I would tell you the first point is the other thing that the services are doing, I think, well, is focusing on managing risk. And I would tell you, one of the things that we all, all ought to be aware of is the whole, and a piece that we're looking at, is the cybersecurity aspect of this. If you were to ask the average American which sector is attacked most, banks, the banking sector, or the energy sector, most, and I do this, and, and a lot of, most people I ask that question to say, oh, banking for sure. 
Now, I'm telling you, that's not the case by a factor of probably 50-fold or better. Every day, our electric grid is the foremost attacked system uh, by through cyber means in the entire United States. So I would tell you whether it's an EMP attack, a cyber attack, whether whatever kind of attack, Energy is something we should all be concerned about because it is the most attacked sector in our infrastructure by a long shot. Now, that was something the DIA director mentioned that in testimony. He mentioned that there were at least three major powers, you know, and he named the Chinese and Russians. And the implication, and at least the folks I've talked to, said that Iran was the third that he was talking about regularly and for a number of years have been probing and kind of wandering around in our electrical and power systems because at this point, like every other industry, the electric industry has networked all of their systems. And unfortunately, it doesn't appear that the security currently is up to snuff to keep them out. Now, if they're in there now, do you think it's that they just haven't determined it's a good idea to try and take it down? Or have we maybe succeeded in some way at at trying to keep them out of those systems? Well, I frankly think that proof is in the pudding. Uh, I think the results speak for themselves. The fact that banking systems haven't collapsed, the fact that our grid hasn't been taken down, I think speaks volumes for the work that's going on behind the scenes to protect the infrastructure of our society. And then, and then on the other side, back to this resilience piece, the work that is going on behind the scenes between levels of government, federal, state, local, between agencies, the interagency cooperation piece, from what I see, I would tell you, there is a heck of a lot of work that people don't see, but you've got to look at the results. I'm an outcomes kind of person, and, and if the grid hasn't been taken down, guarantee you they can't, and, and they haven't been able to, and we've been able to thwart it. You can say the same about terrorist attacks in this country. It's, it's, it's well documented that you know, we have defeated scores of potential attacks inside this country. So my hat's off to all of those folks at every level of government that are doing that. And it's an honor for us in the, in the case of the military to serve our military constituents and helping to bring private sector solutions together with the public sector. And that's really what we do. We bring the best that's out there in the private sector together with the government, local, state, federal level, to solve problems and to help mitigate risk. So my answer to your question, in short, would be I frankly believe that, you know, when I get up in the morning and turn the power on, there are a whole lot of people doing a whole lot of good, and the bad guys are failing. And that's, and that's good for us. Absolutely. Uh, we're talking with Joe Schrodel, who is the executive director of the Society of American Military Engineers. Uh, He's been giving us some insight as to the work being done to make sure that when we get up in the morning, the power goes on. Joe, do you think there there are additional steps we could take? You know, are, are there things we should be doing right now that we could use additional resources for? I frankly think that one one of my main concerns is that we educate the American public and that the American public knows what's going on and that they realize they're a part of this. If you take a look at, you know, this year is the, the 10th anniversary of, the, of Hurricane Katrina uh, and Rita, and we just happen to be sponsoring our annual small business conference in New Orleans this year where we will celebrate the great work in recovering that, that occurred 10 years ago. But I would tell you it's also time that every American understand what the vulnerabilities are, understand how to respond. If you remember President Bush after 9-11, the first thing he said was get back to work. You can't just stop and wait for somebody to fix things. You've got to take the action in your own hands. I think we need to do a lot of work in terms of personal responsibility, educating people to know what's going on. So when something does happen, a big part of resilience is our resolve that we are going to pick ourselves up and continue. When we fail to be able to do that, that's when we have to start worrying. So I think the, on the education side and making sure people really understand what's going on so they can help, they can respond to ensure that we are resilient and thereby we will secure this nation forever. Well, we appreciate your assistance in helping to educate our audience on uh, on this very topic. Uh, we've been talking with Joe Schrodel, who is executive director of the Society of American Military Engineers. Coming up after the break, we'll talk with Gordon Chang, columnist for Forbes.com, about bad news for the Chinese economy and the role North Korea is playing in the Iran nuclear deal. 